this lecture video, we continue our analysis and development of the path model that we began looking at in the previous video. In that video, we did an initial fitting of the model. The question now is, can that model be simplified, and if so, in what ways? Our goal will be to determine whether the path model can be simplified without significantly compromising or degrading its explanatory or predictive ability. This modeling approach is consistent with the principle of parsimony, a heuristic principle that says to select the simplest hypothesis or model possible from among those having equivalent explanatory power or predictive accuracy. Einstein expressed the principle this way. It can scarcely be denied that the supreme goal of all theory is to make the irreducible basic elements as simple and as few as possible without having to surrender the adequate representation of a single datum of experience. The following parsimonious restatement of the principle of parsimony is also often attributed to Einstein. Everything should be kept as simple as possible, but no simpler. But I think this condensation is a bit too parsimonious because it leaves out a crucial element contained in the full expression. All sorts of simplifications are possible, but not all simplifications are consistent with the information at hand. Some are quite inconsistent with the available information. So we don't want to simplify beyond what is consistent with the available information. But what do we mean by consistent and inconsistent? Certainly, no model is completely consistent with the reality it is intended to represent or predict. All models are necessarily, and really by definition, abstractions. And because of that, they will never be able to reproduce or predict reality perfectly. Statistician George Box once stated, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So perfect consistency with reality is not attainable and therefore cannot be required of a model. Consistency, or the lack thereof, with given information is not inherently a categorical concept, but rather a continuous measure. Between the two poles of completely inconsistent on the one hand and completely consistent on the other, there are all gradations in between. So while a categorical decision must ultimately be made about whether or not a proposed simplification is acceptable, the degree of consistency or inconsistency with regard to which such a decision is made is inherently a continuous measure. So this raises the question, how consistent with the available information does a proposed model simplification have to be in order to be acceptable. Asked another way, how inconsistent with the available information does a proposed model simplification have to be in order to be unacceptable? And how can this idea be incorporated into our empirical decision-making process about whether or not a proposed mo model simplification is acceptable given the available data? This is where statistical hypothesis testing comes in. A proposed model simplification being considered is used as the null hypothesis in a hypothesis test, which is performed at a given level of significance chosen by the researcher. If the null hypothesis is not rejected at that level of significance, the conclusion is that the simplification is not unreasonable at that level of significance and therefore, the researcher can choose to adopt that simplification. On the other hand, if the null hypothesis is rejected, then the conclusion is that the proposed model simplification is really not reasonable at that level of significance and therefore should not be adopted. Note that, as is the case with all hypothesis testing, in using this decision-making process, we are not attempting to prove that the null hypothesis is true. That can never be done. Rather, we are looking to see whether there is sufficient evidence in the data 
at a given level of significance to lead us to conclude that the null hypothesis is false, or in this context, that the proposed simplified model is not a correct representation. If the null hypothesis is not rejected, then we can choose to proceed as if the null hypothesis is true. That is, the proposed simplified model is a correct representation of reality. It is certainly possible that future information might come along that calls into question the accuracy of the model. If and when that occurs, we can incorporate that new information with the previously existing information to come up with an updated model that is more consistent with and better represents all available information. This process that I have described is the essence of scientific inquiry and is at the core of the development of scientific theories and how and why they often change over time. So with all that in mind, here is my slightly updated version of the abbreviated version that I like a little bit better. Everything should be kept as simple as is reasonable based on available data, but no simpler. So this is, in a nutshell, the approach that we are going to use in developing structural equation models in general, and in particular, the current path model that we are looking at in these two lecture videos. So here's an outline of what we'll be looking at in this video. First, we're going to review the fitted initial path model and the structure we have to work with. We'll then consider and evaluate a sequence of model simplifications. For each simplification, we'll perform a hypothesis test to determine whether the simplification is reasonable at the 0.05 level of significance. For each proposed model simplification, which comprises the null hypothesis of the test, if the null hypothesis is not rejected, then the proposed model simplification will be retained. On the other hand, if the null hypothesis is rejected, then the proposed model simplification will not be retained. So we've got a lot to do, so let's get to it. So let's first look at the initial model. So here is a path diagram for our model. We have five manifest variables, V1 through V5. V1 is the GPA in required courses in the first year of college. V2 is the GPA in elective courses in the first year of college. V3 is the high school general knowledge score. V4 is an intelligence score obtained in the last year of high school. And V5 is an educational motivation score also obtained in the last year of high school. V1 and V2 are response variables in the model, and V3, V4, and V5 are explanatory variables. Here is a representation of the equations comprising the model in statistical mathematical notation. And so in the initial model, we have five observed manifest variables. We have 15 model parameters that correspond to the asterisks in that path diagram. The model degrees of freedom, which is equal to the difference between the number of non-redundant entries in the covariance matrix for the manifest variables and the number of parameters to be estimated, we can see is equal to zero. And so because the model degrees of freedom is zero, the model is saturated. Now also, the model chi-square value is zero, and this is because the model is saturated and therefore is a perfect predictor of the data. Next, let's look at simplifying assumption one. And so under simplifying assumption one, the slope coefficients of the predictors V4, which is the intelligence score obtained in the last year of high school, and V5, educational motivation score obtained in the last year of high school. The slope coefficients on these predictors on the response variable V2, 
which is the GPA and elective courses in the first year of college, are the same. And so let's look at the impact of this simplifying assumption on the model. The simplifying assumption equates lambda 2, 4 and lambda 2, 5. And so doing that, this is what the simplified model looks like. So the hypotheses to be tested are as follows. The null hypothesis is that lambda 2, 4 is equal to lambda 2, 5. And the alternative hypothesis is that lambda 2, 4 and lambda 2, 5 are not equal. Next, let's look at the impact of this simplifying assumption on the path diagram. So there are 15 asterisks in the initial model and therefore 15 parameters to be estimated in that full model. The simplifying assumption equates lambda 2, 4 and lambda 2, 5. And so doing that, notice that we remove the asterisk from the second lambda 2, 4 because we only need to estimate it once. And so with that, there are now 14 asterisks and therefore 14 parameters to be estimated in the reduced model. So to test this simplifying assumption, we impose on the model the constraint in the null hypothesis, in particular that lambda 2, 4 is equal to lambda 2, 5. The number of observed variables is still 5. In this case, the number of model parameters has decreased by 1. And so the model degrees of freedom is equal to 15 minus 14, or 1. The next slide shows the SAS proc callus code to fit this reduced model. And so to impose the constraints on this model, we change the name of the slope coefficient on V5 from L25 to L24. Next, let's verify that the specification to SAS is correct. And so looking at the modeling information section of the FIT summary table, we see that we have five manifest variables specified and that the number of moments, in other words, the number of non-redundant entries in the covariance matrix is 15. In addition, the number of parameters to be estimated is 14. Next, looking at the absolute index section of the FIT summary table, we see that we have one degree of freedom associated with this model. Note in addition that the chi-square value for this model is 0 0.2210. And so the chi-square value for this reduced model is 0 0.221. The chi-square value for the full model you'll recall, was zero because it was a saturated model. The value of the test statistic is the difference in the model chi-square values, in particular, the chi-square value for the reduced model minus the chi-square value for the full model. And so this is equal to 0.221. The number of degrees of freedom associated with this test is given by the difference in the degrees of freedom for the reduced model and the full model. And so for this test, we have one degree of freedom. Now here is the SAS code to calculate the test statistic, the critical point, and the p-value for the test. And so you can see here that again, the value of the test statistic is 0.221. The critical point for the test is 3.84146, or 3.841 rounded to two decimal places. And finally, the p-value for the test is 0.63828. And so this is a one degree of freedom chi-square test. The test statistic is 0.221. The critical point for the test is the upper 0.05 percentage point of the chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom. Now note that the test statistic 0.221 is not greater than the critical point 3.841. And so we know then we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. The p-value for the test 
is 0.63828. And because that is not less than or equal to the significance level, 0.05, again, we know we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. And so in conclusion, there is insufficient evidence at the 0.05 level of significance to reject the simplifying assumption that lambda 2.4 is equal to lambda 2.5. The reduced model incorporating this simplification will be retained and become the model for comparing with the reduced model for the next simplifying assumption tested. So is it reasonable to assume that lambda 2.4 is equal to lambda 2.5? Yes. Since we failed to reject this assumption at the 0.05 level of significance, it is a reasonable assumption at that level of significance. Next, let's look at simplifying assumption 2. Under this assumption, the variances of the two error terms E1 and E2 are equal. And so here are the hypotheses to be tested. The null hypothesis is that the variance of E1 is equal to the variance of E2. The alternative hypothesis is that the variance of E1 is not equal to the variance of E2. And so here is a path diagram showing the impact of simplifying assumption 2. Now there are 14 asterisks in this path diagram and therefore 14 parameters to be estimated in the current full model. The simplifying assumption equates the variance of E1 and the variance of E2. And so when we apply that simplification, notice that we remove the asterisk from E2 because its variance no longer needs to be estimated separately because under this assumption, it's the same as the variance of E1. So now there are 13 asterisks and therefore 13 parameters to be estimated in the reduced model. The constraint to be imposed on the model is that the variances of E1 and E2 are equal. The number of observed variables is still equal to five, but the number of model parameters is equal to 13. And so in this case, the number of degrees of freedom associated with this model is equal to 15 minus 13 or two. The next slide shows the SAS PROC CALIS code to fit this reduced model. And in order to impose the constraints on this model, we change the name of the variance of E2 from VAR E2 to VAR E1. Next, let's look at some SAS output to verify that we've specified the model correctly. And so first, looking at the modeling information section of the fit summary table, we see that we have the correct number of variables and the correct number of moments listed here. And we also have the correct number of parameters indicated in the output. In the absolute index section of the fit summary table, we see that the model as specified has two degrees of freedom associated with it, and that is correct. And finally, note that the chi-square value associated with this reduced model is 0.737. And so the chi-square value for the reduced model is 0.737. The chi-square value for the current full model is 0.221. The test statistic is the difference between these two chi-square values which is 0.516. And the number of degrees of freedom associated with this test is equal to the difference in the two model degrees of freedom. So two minus one or one. And then here is the SAS code to calculate the test statistic, the critical point and the p-value for the test. And we can see here that the uh, calculated value of the test statistic is as we've calculated by hand, 0.516. The critical point is 
And uh, in, in this test, the p-value is 0 0.47255. So this is a one degree of freedom chi-square test. The value of the test statistic is 0 0.516. The critical point is again, 3.841. And because the test statistic, 0.516, does not exceed the critical point, 3.841, we know that we're going to fail to reject this null hypothesis. The p-value for the test is 0.47255, and because that is not less than or equal to the significance level at which we're testing, 0.05, again, we know that we're going to fail to reject this null hypothesis. And so in conclusion, there is insufficient evidence at the 0 0.05 level of significance to reject the simplifying assumption that the variances of E1 and E2 are equal. The reduced model incorporating the simplification will be retained and become the model for comparing with the reduced model for the next simplifying assumption tested. So is it reasonable to assume that the variance of E1 and the variance of E2 are equal? Yes. Since we failed to reject this assumption at the 0.05 level of significance, it is a reasonable assumption at that level of significance. Next, let's look at simplifying assumption three. Under this simplifying assumption, the variances of the explanatory variables V3, V4, and V5 are all equal. The null hypothesis to be tested is that the variances of V3, V4, and V5 are all equal. The alternative hypothesis is that at least one of these variances is different than the others. Here's a path diagram showing the impact of this simplifying assumption on the model. So in this diagram, there are 13 asterisks and therefore 13 parameters to be estimated in the current full model. The simplifying assumption equates the variance of V3, the variance of V4, and the variance of V5. And so imposing that simplification, we see that the asterisks on V4 and V5 are no longer needed. There are now 11 asterisks and therefore 11 parameters that need to be estimated in this reduced model. And so the constraint to be imposed on the model is that the variances of V3, V4, and V5 are all equal. The number of observed parameters in this model is still five, but the number of model parameters has been reduced by two to 11. The number of degrees of freedom associated with this model is therefore 15 minus 11 or four. The next slide shows the SASPROC CALIS code to fit this reduced model. And so to impose these constraints, we change the names of the variances for V4 and V5 to VAR V3. Next, let's verify the specification to SAS by looking at some of the SAS output. And so first, looking at the modeling information section of the FIT summary table, we see that we have the correct number of variables and the correct number of moments. In addition, we also have the correct number of parameters to be estimated in this model. Next, we see that we have the correct number of degrees of freedom associated with this model. And we also note that the chi-square value is quite large for this model, 301.1488. So the value of the chi-square statistic for the reduced model is 301.149. The chi-square value for the full model is 0.737. The test statistic is the difference between these two chi-square values which turns out to be 300.412.
the number of degrees of freedom associated with the test is the difference in the degrees of freedom for the two models. And so we have four minus two or two degrees of freedom associated with this test. Again, we have the SAS code to calculate the test statistic, the critical point and the p-value for the test. We see that the test statistic is equal to 300.412. The critical point for this test is 5.99146. And the p-value is very, very close to zero. In fact, it's so close to zero that uh, SAS just reports zero for its value. And so this is a two degree of freedom chi-square test. The test statistic is equal to 300.412. The critical point is the upper 0.05 percentage point of the chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom. And this value is 5.991, rounded to three decimal places. And since the test statistic, 300.412 is greater than 5.992, we know that we're going to reject the null hypothesis. Now the p-value we know that it's less than 0 0.0001. And so we know that it's going to be less than or equal to 0.05. And so by that criterion as well, we know that we reject the null hypothesis in this case. And so our conclusion is that there is sufficient evidence at the 0 0.05 level of significance to reject the simplifying assumption that the variances of V3, V4, and V5 are equal. Therefore, this model simplification will not be retained. So is it reasonable to assume that the variances of V3, V4, and V5 are the same? Absolutely not. It would not be a reasonable assumption at any level of significance greater than or equal to 0.0001. Next, let's look at simplifying assumption number four. Under this simplifying assumption, the slope coefficient of the predictor V4, which is the intelligence score obtained in the last year of high school, for the response variable V1, the GPA in required courses in the first year of college, is equal to zero. In other words, changes in V4 do not induce and are not associated with changes in V1. And so the hypotheses to be tested are as follows. The null hypothesis is that lambda 1, 4 is equal to zero. The alternative hypothesis is that lambda 1, 4 is not equal to zero. Here's a path diagram showing the impact of this simplifying assumption on the model. In this path diagram, there are 13 asterisks and therefore 13 parameters to be estimated in the current full model. The simplifying assumption sets lambda 1, 4 equal to zero. And so when we do that, that entire path goes away. There are now 12 asterisks and therefore 12 parameters to be estimated in this reduced model. And so the constraint to be imposed on the model is that lambda 1, 4 is equal to zero. The number of manifest variables is still five. The number of model parameters has been reduced by one to 12. And the model degrees of freedom is equal to three. The next slide shows the SAS proc callus code to fit this reduced model. And so to impose the constraint on the null hypothesis, we set lambda 1, 4 equal to zero. And essentially what we do is we just remove V4 from that model for V1. So let's look at the SAS output to verify that we've specified the model correctly. Looking at the modeling information in the fit summary table, we see that we have the correct number of variables and the correct number of moments we also see that we have 12 parameters to be estimated in this model, which we know to be correct. In addition, we see that we have three degrees of freedom associated uh, with this model, 
and that's correct. And finally, we see that the chi-square statistic for this model is 1.0112. And so the chi-square value for this reduced model is 1.0112. The chi-square value for the current full model is 0.737. The value of the test statistic is the difference between these two values, which is 0.2742. And the number of degrees of freedom associated with this test is equal to 3 minus 2, or 1. Here is the SAS code to calculate the test statistic, the critical point, and the p-value for the test. And so we see here that the value of the test statistic is 0.2742. The critical point for the test is 3.841. And the p-value for the test is 0.60053. So this is a one degree of freedom chi-square test. The value of the test statistic is 0.2742. The critical point for the test is the upper 0.05 percentage point of the chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom. And that value is 3.841, rounded to three decimal places. Since the value of the test statistic 0.2742 does not exceed the critical point, 3.841, we know that we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. The p-value for the test is 0.60053, and because that is not less than or equal to 0.05, which is the significance level at which we're testing, again, we know that we're going to fail to reject this null hypothesis. And so our conclusion is, that there is insufficient evidence at the 0 0.05 level of significance to reject the simplifying assumption that lambda 1, 4 is equal to zero. This reduced model incorporating this simplification will be retained and become the model for comparing with the reduced model for the next simplifying assumption tested. And so is it reasonable to assume that lambda 1, 4 is equal to zero? Yes. Since we failed to reject this assumption at the 0.05 level of significance, it is a reasonable assumption at that level of significance. Next, let's look at simplifying assumption 5. And so under this simplifying assumption, the slope coefficient of the predictor V5, which is an educational motivation score obtained in the last year of high school, for the response variable V1, the GPA in required courses in the first year of college, is equal to zero. In other words, changes in V5 do not induce and are not associated with changes in V1. And so the hypotheses to be tested are as follows. The null hypothesis is that lambda 1 5 is equal to zero. The alternative hypothesis is that lambda 1, 5 is not equal to zero. So here's the path diagram showing the impact of this simplifying assumption on the model. There are 12 asterisks in this path diagram and therefore 12 parameters to be estimated in the current full model. The simplifying assumption sets lambda 1, 5 equal to zero. And so when we apply that, that path from V5 to V1 goes away. There are now 11 asterisks and therefore 11 parameters to be estimated in this reduced model. And so the constraint to be imposed on the model is that lambda 1, 5 is equal to zero. The number of observed variables is still five, but the number of model parameters has been decreased by one, and so we have 11 model parameters to be estimated. The number of degrees of freedom associated with this model is 15 minus 11, or four. The next slide shows the SAS proc callus code to fit this reduced model. And so to impose this constraint on the model, 
we set L15 equal to zero. And so the way that we actually do that is just to remove V5 from the equation for V1. Next, let's verify that we've specified the model correctly to SAS by looking at some of the SAS output. And so looking at the modeling information section of the fit summary table, we see that we have the correct number of variables, five, and the correct number of moments, 15. We also see that we have the correct number of parameters to be estimated, which is 11. Next, we see that the number of degrees of freedom associated with this model is four, so that's correct. And we note that the value of the chi-square statistic for this model is 1.4471. And so the chi-square statistic for this reduced model is 1.4471. The chi-square value for the current full model is 1.0112. The value of the test statistic is equal to the difference in these two chi-square values, and so that is 0.4359. And finally, the number of degrees of freedom associated with this test is the difference in the model degrees of freedom for the two models, and so that's 4 minus 3, or 1. Here is the SAS code to calculate the test statistic, the critical point, and the p-value for the test. And so we see here that the value of the test statistic is 0.4359. The critical point is 3.84146. And the p-value for this test is 0.50911. And so this is a one degree of freedom chi-square test. The value of the test statistic is 0.4359. The value of the critical point is 3.841, and since the value of the test statistic, 0.4359, does not exceed the critical point, 3.841, we know that we're going to fail to reject this null hypothesis. The p-value for the test is 0.50911, and because that is not less than or equal to the significance level of the test, 0.05, Again, we know that we're going to fail to reject this null hypothesis. And so the conclusion is that there is insufficient evidence at the 0 0.05 level of significance to reject the simplifying assumption that lambda 1.5 is equal to zero. The reduced model incorporating this simplification will be retained. And so is it reasonable to assume that lambda 1.5 is equal to zero? Yes. Since we would fail to reject this assumption for any level of significance that is greater than or equal to 0.50911, it is a reasonable assumption at any significance level that we would really ever use in practice. So this completes our model simplification process. Now let's remember our parsimonious statement of the principle of parsimony. Everything should be kept as simple as is reasonable, but no simpler. And our model simplification process reflects that principle. So let's look at the final model. Here is a path diagram for the final model. First, we see that explanatory variables V3, V4, and V5 are all allowed to impact the response variable V2. But notice that the slope coefficients on V4 and V5 going into V2 are both constrained to be the same, lambda 2, 4. In addition, we see that only V3 is allowed to impact response variable V1. And finally, notice that we, because we don't have an asterisk on E2, the variances of E1 and E2 are constrained to be the same. Here is a path diagram for this model produced by SAS Proc Callus.
And so again, we see that explanatory variables V3, V4, and V5 are all allowed to impact response variable V2. But that the slope coefficients for V4 and V5 going into V2 are constrained to be equal and their common value is estimated to be 0.14. Next, we see that only explanatory variable V3 is allowed to directly impact response variable V1. Note also that the variances of the error terms for V1 and V2 are constrained to be equal and their common value is estimated to be 0.25. Finally, note that the variances of V3, V4, and V5 are all different. They're allowed to be different in this model. And so the variance of V3 is estimated to be 47.46. The variance of V4 is, allowed, is uh, estimated to be 10.27. And the variance of V5 is estimated to be 2.68. Now, what about model fit? Well, we have a table of fit indices at the bottom right corner of our path diagram, so let's take a look at those. First, we see that the model chi-square value is less than the model degrees of freedom, and so there's no indication there of a lack of fit. In addition, the model chi-square p-value is quite large, 0.84, and so it is highly insignificant. The adjusted goodness of fit index, which rounded to two decimal places is 0.99, is at or above the mid 0.9s. The comparative fit index, which rounded to two decimal places is 1, is indeed at or above the mid 0.9s. The RMSEA, the root mean squared error of approximation, rounded to two decimal places is zero, and so that is less than 0 0.05. And so based on these fit indices and the criteria associated with them, the model appears to fit the data very well. So let's summarize what we've done. Five simplifying assumptions about the PATH model were considered and evaluated by performing the appropriate hypothesis tests in sas calis using the model comparison approach. Four simplifying assumptions were considered to be reasonable given the data at the 0.05 level of significance and were therefore retained. One simplifying assumption was not considered to be reasonable given the data at the 0.05 level of significance and was therefore not retained. And finally, none of the model fit indices indicated a lack of fit to the data. The final model appears to fit the data very well. So we've accomplished what we set out to do. I'll see you in the next lecture video.